Zooey mama, how's it going everyone? We are back with another video of buy or bust. This time we are talking about the newest season pass card, Kate Bishop, kicking off the Young Avengers season. And I'm gonna go into the detail of Kate Bishop, her abilities, some decks I think she works out in that you can try out right away when the season starts if you do get her, as well as just the good, the bad, the pros and cons and give my overall ratings on this card. So first up, the new season does start August 6th. Kate Bishop is the season pass card. Marvel Boy is the new card coming to Spotlight that same week. I will have another video on him coming out tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. I'll also go into detail of this Spotlight cache. Kate Bishop is a two cost, three powered card with the very flexible, interesting ability on reveal Add two arrows to your hand. Now let's take a look at all the possible arrows and their abilities. And I should mention before I forget that this is still data mined, okay? The official season announcement video has not come out, but even after it does, sometimes cards still change. So we really don't know for sure until the card actually comes to Marvel Snap. Uh, but we have four possible arrows showing for Kate Bishop, but she's only gonna give you two of them each time she reveals, okay? Four possible, but you're only seeing two. First up is the Acid Arrow. It's got one cost minus two power. It's on a real switch sides. This is like a little mini, more efficient green goblin. All the arrows cost one. This is the only one with negative power, and obviously it's, you know, being annoying to your opponent. This might be my favorite arrow, okay? I just like being a jerk to my opponent. Then we've got the Grapple Arrow, which is three power on reveal. After you play your next card, move it to this location. Okay, so you play your grapple arrow first, wherever location. The next card you're gonna play, it's gonna move over to the grapple arrow. So nice move synergy, but kind of hard to plan for. It is the only arrow that synergizes with move at all. Then we've got the basic arrow, which works like Hawkeye. On reveal, if you play a card at this location next turn, plus three power. Okay, Hawkeye gets to a 1-5 now. Basic arrow only gets to 1-4, but a 1-4 is still pretty good. And then the Pym arrow is just like Ant-Man, also capping at four power. Ongoing, if your side of this location is full, plus three power. So really the grapple arrow, basic arrow, and Pym arrow are relatively similar. Okay, grapple arrow only has three power instead of four but you're generally not preparing to get the move arrow, and so you're kind of using it as stats, okay? The acid arrow is the most unique. It is less stats. It's only minus two for your opponent, but it's the only one that takes up space on your opponent's side of the board, okay? So it's a, a bit more a niche or kind of tech heavy, but like I said, I think the acid arrow is my favorite overall. It seems very consistent though, okay? It's all cheap, good power. So let's get into some of Kate Bishop's best synergies in Marvel Snap. Well, first up, we've got the Collector, okay? Kate Bishop is adding two cards to your hand. There's currently no other two cost card that does that. Snowguard does that at a one cost. Agent Coulson does it as a three cost, okay? Now you could have a one, two, and a three cost card that all add two cards to your hand. So you pair that up with the Collector, he's gonna get a really big power boost. Then we've got Mockingbird. And actually, Kate Bishop is perfect for Mockingbird. Snowguard generates two cards to hand, but they both cost three, okay? So it's actually hard to play them, to play the Hawk and the Bear and have a discount Mockingbird. Whereas with Kate Bishop, all of her arrows cost one. You're only getting two of the four, but they all cost one. So they're very easy and efficient to play and very consistent to give Mockingbird that cost reduction. And then we've got Marvel Boy, okay? He's also the new card this week. Again, I'm gonna talk about him more in my video tomorrow, but in short, he adds plus one power to three different one cost cards at the end of every turn. So if you have one cost cards, Marvel Boy can power them up, and all the arrows are one cost cards, and you gain at least two of them, okay? So that is just direct synergy with another new card right there. In terms of some locations that could really help you out, well, something like Lake Hellas, right? It's just giving one cost cards plus two power. Also, you know, locations like the big house where you can only play cheaper cards in there. It's really gonna favor Kate Bishop and her arrows. 
and then something like Panopticron, okay? Similar to Mockingbird, these cards did not start in your deck, so they're great for powering up Collector. They discount Mockingbird, they get extra power on Panopticron. And, you know, previously, before this latest OTA, I did have Loki as a huge synergy. I mean, I thought Kate Bishop was just going to be awesome. In Loki decks, Loki did just take a huge nerf, and I'm afraid that synergy is nowhere to be found anymore. Now, if you are playing Kate Bishop, what are some cards you don't want to run into? Uh, first up is Sandman. And this one's a bit tough because Sandman did not get nerfed recently. A lot of other kind of controlling cards did, right? Alongside with the Arishan package, we saw Leech get nerfed, we saw Doc Ock get nerfed, and Sandman did not. And so your options to control your opponents are now more limited. So Sandman might actually see more play, okay? You might be kind of like the last man standing for these really annoying five cost cards to try and shut down your opponent's play. If Sandman does see more play soon, then that is bad for Kate Bishop, okay? Because you're getting two arrows and you don't have to play them right away, so you're often gonna try maybe saving them for a later turn. Well, if a Sandman comes down, you're no longer playing those arrows. So while I don't think Kate Bishop gets countered by too many cards, she just comes down on turn two, it's kind of hard to stop what she's doing. Sandman will stop her. Okay, another card is Juggernaut. Juggernaut has been seeing a pretty big uptick in play recently. He's been seeing play with like the Athena, Ravana type decks, and he's hitting cards all over the board. If you're playing a lot of cards in the same turn, you're at big risk of accidentally clogging a lane when your opponent plays Juggernaut, okay? If you're just playing multiple cards same lane, they Juggernaut you, those cards might go fill, say, your left lane, for example. And so that's going to be tough. Okay, clog decks are always going to be a bit annoying, but Juggernaut as well may be a bit more unexpected. You may not be playing a clog deck, but you may accidentally get clogged. And then last up, of course, I just have to mention it, is Killmonger. Okay, but fortunately, I don't think this is too bad. Again, you don't have to play the arrows right away. So you can just play Kate Bishop on two and save the arrows. You know, maybe if you're against a destroy deck, you can assume they have Killmonger. You just save the arrows, okay? Now, if it is the basic arrow, you're, you're going to have to just play it. But other than that, you can save them for turn six if possible. To look at the good and the bad for Kate Bishop, first up for the good, she can get up to 411, okay? You have to pay two for Kate, and then each of the arrows costs one. But if you do get the arrows that go up to four power each, you're essentially paying four energy total, and you're getting 11 power. Okay, that can be spread out over multiple lanes, it can be in the same lane, and it's gonna be spread out over multiple turns as well. So it's kind of just nice having those options can kind of fill out your curve in terms of energy each turn. Card generation is just a good thing, okay? We have a lot of cards in the game that generate other cards, and it's nice. You keep your hand full, again, you kind of never run out of options, which is nice. The generate arrows, while well, there is a bit of variance, they're all cheap and they're all effective, okay? I compared to Snowguard already, you want generated stuff that you can just play easily. It's going to feel really nice. You can go for a direct synergy with Kate Bishop. You know, maybe you're playing her with Mockingbird. Maybe you're playing her with Marvel Boy or Collector. But maybe not. Maybe you're just putting her in a deck because she ends up getting good stats. And sometimes you get a little bit of tech options, like with the moving grapple arrow or the acid arrow that's going to fill your opponent's spot. Okay, so you can just play her and really anything, pretty flexible. And then again, three of the four arrows are doing something almost identical. It's really the acid arrow that's the negative power on your opponent's side of the board that's the most unique. And so you kind of know what to expect. You don't know the exact two you're gonna get, but they fill a similar role, and so you can prepare for that. In terms of the bad aspects for Kate Bishop, well, first of all, if you play her late in the game, she's just a two, three, okay? You cannot play her arrows on the same turn you play her. You gotta play her, she adds them to your hand, starting the turn after, you can play the arrows. So if you draw her late, it's kinda bad. The card generation, I said is good. Well, it used to be great with Loki. I mentioned that synergy is gone, and I, I really thought it was gonna take Kate Bishop to the next level. I thought she might be a little bit busted with Loki. That's no longer the case. Maybe you can still play it, but she's not really adding a bunch of ammunition to Loki anymore. Um, it is taking up board space. Okay, that's kind of why I like the Acid Arrow, because if you're not getting that, if you're getting just Kate Bishop and two of the other arrows, 
you're taking up three spots on your board, okay? That may really clog things up, and especially if some locations are hard to play in, that could be tough, okay? You may have games where you actually don't play all the arrows because it's taking up too much space. There is little tech involved. It's mainly for the stats, mainly for the power. There's just a tiny bit of tech that's possible but not guaranteed because, again, you're only going to see two of the four arrows each time. It's not like Nico Minoru where if you just wait long enough, it's going to cycle through all the spells. So you're just going to see two unless you manage to you know, bounce Kate back to hand or trigger her ability again. This is just my friendly reminder to please give this video a like, drop a comment, and subscribe to the channel if you have not already to help me help you even more. Because in addition to just talking about the new cards, I also go into details of the spotlight caches for each season to help you make a decision of which one you're going to pick up as well as a series 4 and series 5 tier list buy guide that I update monthly. So to look at Kate's floor and ceiling, her at her floor or reasonable worse is what I mentioned earlier. If you get her on turn 6, she's not doing anything, okay? It's just that simple. Now this isn't actually horrible. I mean, she's still a 2-3. You know, there are a lot of cards out there that when they miss, they don't even have decent stats to back it up. Kate's still a 2-3, okay? That, that's still decent. It's obviously not super competitive, but it's not a bad floor. And her ceiling isn't too far off. It's actually not crazy. I, I don't think it's like super overpowered, but you're basically shooting for the max power, okay? Again, it's hard to plan around the tech, but if you can get the basic and the pim arrows and you get them to power up, she's essentially a 411, but it's spread out, okay? So it's a 411 that's dodging Shang-Chi, right? And I don't actually think this is overpowered. I mean, we have some 410s in the game. We have some cards that, you know, cost three, but they can get bigger if, you know, triggered well, like Sage or something. So I don't think this is crazy. And I think on average, actually, she's going to be very close to her ceiling, right? Even if you get the grapple arrow and the acid arrow, which are the lowest raw power arrows, you're still getting a 4-8 Kate Bishop. Okay, so the range, if you manage to play both arrows, it's going to be 4-8 to 4-11. Okay, it's just 8 power to 11 power. It's a range of 3. The lower power you have, the more kind of tech you get with filling up your opponent's space or you get the movement from the grapple arrow. And I think you're often gonna be able to play both arrows, okay? As long as you play Kate early enough in the game, you know, you don't draw her on turn five or six, you're gonna be able to play the arrows. And so I think she doesn't have the craziest ceiling, but on average, she's actually pretty close to her ceiling. Let me know what you think um, about her average, if you think you will almost always be able to play both of her arrows, or if you think it's actually gonna be hard, whether that's just because you know, playing two cards is two extra energy, or if you think it's going to take up too much space on the board. So for the decks I've put together for Kate Bishop, first up, we are looking at this Young Avengers Zoo list. Okay, so we've got a Zoo deck in here. We've even got Kaira to protect our one-cost cards, but we've got Kate Bishop. She's giving you arrows, which are also one-cost cards, so they will get powered up by Kazar. And then we've got Marvel Boy, okay, again. I'm going to have a separate video on him, but he's giving plus one power to three different one cost cards at the end of each turn. Okay, so every turn he's dishing out plus three power max if you have at least three other one cost cards on the board. And you've got Squirrel Girl in here to do that. You've got Shanna in here to add three one cost. Like there's so many ways to do it. And then you're going to power everything up with Kazar with Blue Marvel and then slap down a big fat Gilgamesh, okay? Because he's going to see all these cards powered up. He's going to get really huge. And Kate Bishop's arrows, the squirrels, and Shanna's one cost that she generates are all going to discount Mockingbird. And with Kaira in here, you know, even if this deck becomes popular, what are people going to do about it, right? If they start running Killmonger, you just have Kaira in here. So this is actually really hard to deal with. I mean, if if someone gets away with having this Marvel Boy just power up everything, and now they've got these arrows just popping off power, it it might be hard to deal with. We we may see a legit zoo meta, okay, at, at high ranks, an actual serious zoo meta. I never thought the day would come, but we might be here. Next up, I've got this Airshem Handfill deck. Now Airshem, 
just took some really big hits, okay? Let's be honest. He just got a bunch of cards nerfed, okay? It was a bunch of cards that were seeing play in his deck. They're all getting nerfed. But we do have the extra energy from Erishim still. He does obviously still work with Quinjet. And he still works with Mockingbird. Well, Mockingbird we know likes Kate Bishop because the arrows discount her. So I said, hey, let's throw in kind of this Loki lookalike deck, but without Loki. Okay, it kind of looks almost like the classic Loki decks that always had the Collector. So we've got the Collector in here. He can get powered up by Snowguard, Cable, Kate Bishop, Agent Coulson. And then, of course, again, we've got the big powerhouses through Mockingbird and through Devil Dinosaur. So I'm interested to see how this list goes. I'm interested just in general to see which Arishem decks kind of remain in the meta, if any, right? If, if any of these cards, you know, what if without Loki, Agent Coulson and Cable just kind of, you know, go away? I mean, Cable will still see playing Mill, I guess, but Agent Coulson is, is kind of dependent on some kind of hand fill synergy working. So I'm very interested to see how this deck works. And then last up, I love me some Jane Jaw. Okay, some real Lockjaw shenanigans. Now with the Lockjaw change, you can play as many cards as you want on his lane on the same turn, and you'll swap all of them for cards in your deck. So here we have the hammer package with Thor, Better A Bill, play Jane Foster, draw the hammers, hopefully play those hammers on Lockjaw. If we don't get the hammers going though, we do have Kate Bishop's arrows that we can drop on top of Lockjaw, and they're just going to get bigger stuff from the deck, okay? So it serves that purpose to give the arrows as Lockjaw fodder, but also sometimes these decks just are a bit too slow in the early game, right? If you just had like the Wasp and Psylocke, it's a bit too slow, at least with Kate Bishop. You're starting off, you're getting a little bit of power on the board. You now have some other one cost cheap options. If there's some locations that you really need to just play something in early, you kind of have a few more options now. So to give my overall ratings and predictions for Kate Bishop, while we look at this great Flaviano artwork that you will get at level 50 of the season pass track, if you do pick up the season pass this month, in terms of being fun, I think she's good fun. Okay, she's interesting. She doesn't seem toxic, even though she has this acid arrow, you're not getting it all the time. And so I don't think she's gonna be super annoying for your opponent, but you're also seeing a bit of RNG, right? The arrows are pretty similar, but it's still gonna be fun to see which of the four you get, right? Which two you get each time. And I think that's just nice. A card that does something different each time you play it, that's fun. In terms of being flexible, I think she has good flexibility. Like I mentioned, you can really try to synergize her but you could also just play her as like a general two cost card, right? I mean, White Widow just took a small nerf. You could even just take a White Widow in some of your decks and put in Kate Bishop. She's just good power, okay? And she gives you flexibility. Again, sometimes that's helpful around certain locations. In terms of being competitive, I think she's good, okay? Overall, I'm giving her uh, good fun, good flexibility, good levels of being competitive. Now, previously when I'd done just my whole season preview, I thought Kate Bishop was going to be amazing for levels of competitive. I thought maybe too good, but that was really on the basis that she was going to be in auto include in Loki. Okay. And now that's just not the case. Uh, maybe she sees playing Erishem. Maybe Erishem Loki sticks around a bit. Maybe just Loki sticks around. I don't know, but she does not have the same synergy with Loki anymore. The fact that he's not replacing your hand means just filling up your hand doesn't help him nearly as much. And so I think that loses big value for Kate Bishop. But I think she's still a good card. I think she's solid. Overall, I think she's worth picking up for two reasons. First of all, I do think she's just a good card and a fun card. And she's going to see play in probably a few different decks because of how flexible she is. So if you don't get her at times, you may be like, oh, what can I replace this card with? Right? She's kind of one of those. But it is the season pass. And like I say, basically every month, the season pass is the best use of spending real money in Marvel Snap that you can do. Okay. If you spend money on the season pass, you're getting the best bang for your buck. You're getting the most resources in comparison to spending money on anything else, whether it's just gold or buying certain bundles. The season pass is simply the best value. So if you do go for it, 
go for it. Don't stop now. And I think Kate Bishop is actually one of the strongest or at least best season pass cards that we've had in a while. So if you get it or you get sometimes, I definitely recommend picking up the season pass for Kate Bishop. So those are my thoughts. Those are my predictions. Let me know what you think of Kate in the comments down below. What decks or combos you think she's going to work best with? Are there any I miss? You know, maybe you got some obvious ones that you think she's going to be really good in and I didn't mention. So let me know in the comments down below what those are. I look forward to reading those comments and responding to you guys. I, I love reading all the comments all the time. Uh, but until then, stay positive. We'll see you next time. Are you the hip squad? No. Hey. Marvel to the left. Are you guys ready? You guys are fancy. Yes. Nice. Oh my. That's three strikes already. Team Yellow wins Snapperty. He has gone undefeated in the ring. Taking it back home with me, ladies and gentlemen. That created a very interesting meta. It's going to be epic. We got some awesome competitors here. Plus Misty. one. Night Misty trigger. Knight going Misty to the Knight right. Get to over the top. Win it. And Rocco Sacco wins it in an amazing final game. Rocco Sacco is your SnapCon 2023 champion.